Hello students, in the previous uh, lectures we have studied about the different types of um, um, geosynthetics and, um, and their uh, functions and uh, let us uh, look at the different type of polymers that are used uh, for the manufacture of geosynthetics and then uh, briefly about their manufacturing techniques. Just the outline of the lecture is, uh, we will um, briefly uh, look at the different types of polymers used for manufacture of geosynthetics and then um, the some details on the manufacture of some type of geosynthetics. Why do we need to um, study about the polymers? The reason is both the short term and the long term properties of the geosynthetics depend very much on the type of polymer used for the manufacture of geosynthetics and the manufacturing process that is used for uh, fabricating the geosynthetic. Well, all the geosynthetics except for uh, the natural uh, products are made of polymers. As we have seen, the natural products are the coir and the jute and um, apart from uh, these two varieties, all others are made of polymers and the word polymer itself is derived from Greek language. The poly means many and meros means parts and uh, basically a polymer consists of several individual poly, um, parts which are known as monomers. They are all joined together by some process to produce a polymer and uh, then each uh, small part as I mentioned earlier is called as a monomer and uh, the type of polymer um, differs in the way the, these monomers are linked together. The monomer is a molecular compound, it's actually it is basically uh, the basic unit to produce a polymer and the molecular weight of a polymer is the degree of polymerization, it's actually the degree of polymerization is the number of monomeric units packed into one unit of a polymer and uh, the molecular weight is the degree of polymerization multiplied by the molecular weight of each of these uh, single uh, repeating units. The um, increased molecular weight results in higher tensile strength and higher impact strength, higher stress crack resistance and better heat resistance. Basically it means that uh, we want to produce a geosynthetic with as much molecular weight as um, possible or as required to to produce a geosynthetic that has sufficient um, strength and other properties or in other words we can always design um, a required uh, geosynthetic to have pro properties that are required for our um, field applications and uh, the, the polymers they differ from each other by the manner in which the cross linking and the number of repeating units are uh, linked together and uh, there are uh, nearly 50,000 varieties of um, commercial available polymers. So actually there are very large number of polymers. And how are these uh, individual units linked together? The bonds within the polymer molecules are due to van der Waals forces and the permanent dipoles are hydrogen bonds and the bonds between the molecular chains are due to cross linking by covalent bonds. The actually these bonds uh, within the polymers are very similar to what we normally study in the clay soils in terms of uh, the secondary bonds and then the primary bonds and so on. So these uh, we can imagine that the polymer is something like a clay wherein um, individual um, particles or individual units they are all bonded together to produce a mass. In the, in the case of soils we call it as clay but in the case of polymers we call it as a polymer. And based on the way uh, the different monomers they are linked together the cross linking the polymers are divided into two fundamental categories. These are 
thermoplastic and thermoset. The thermoplastic polymer is the one in which uh, this um, uh, polymer can be repeatedly heated to its softening point and made into desired shapes and cooled to preserve the shape. And we can repeat this process as many times as possible or as required. Whereas a thermoset polymer is actually this heating and cooling process, it cannot be repeated, it can only be done once. And um, if you try to re reheat uh, the thermoset plastic or uh, thermoset polymer, it will just simply degrade. And uh, most of the or all the geosynthetics, they are made of thermoplastic um, type of polymer. And some examples of the th thermoplastics are the polyethylene, polypropylene and polyester. And some examples of the thermoset materials are butyl, nitrile and epidium. And as I mentioned earlier, all the geosynthetics are made of thermoplastic polymers. The major ingredients of uh, polymers are the resin uh, the, um, that is the bulk of a polymer consists of the resin, resin and the name of the polymer is derived from the type of resin that is used for the, for the, the manufacture of polymer. And then we add a bit of carbon black or uh, colouring agent. The carbon black is um, usually added to preserve its long term properties and so that the polymer is not affected by ultraviolet rays or um, exposure to sunlight and so on. And we also add some stabilizers uh, so that the workability at short term um, increases during the processing time. And then we also add some additives so that the long term um, uh, behavior is improved in terms of the antioxidants and so on. And uh, some of the types of polymers and their formulations are um, listed here and the bottom table. The polyethylene, it consists of 95 to 98 percent resin and uh, we may add a bit of uh, carbon black 2 to 3 percent and additives percentage is very low 0 0.25 to, mm, to 1 percent. And polypropylene, the flexible type which is of mm, our interest. 85 to 98 percent resin and the fillers could be about 0 to 13 percent, carbon black 2 to 4 percent and additives about 0 0.25 to 2 percent and polyvinyl chloride is about um, 50 to 70 percent resin and, um, and some um, plasticizer so that its workability is increased and then fillers and then carbon black and additives and so on. So actually the last uh, variety is the polystyrene. It's actually the polystyrene is um, a very extremely lightweight material and one form of polystyrene that we see is all these um, computers and other electronic goods, they are packed in um, um, very highly um, durable material which is in white in color, which is very hard but at the same time it is tough. And, um, and uh, that uh, material is the polystyrene and its resin is 98 to 99 uh, percent and then carbon black we do not add because um, it is not exposed to sunlight and so on and additives about 1 to 2 percent. And the polystyrene is a very important material that we use for construction of um, embankments and other things and extremely soft clays because of its lightweight nature. Poly, let us look at uh, the different types of, um, of these uh, polymers. The polyvinyl chloride, the PVC is produced from its monomer vinyl chloride and the PVC is actually it is a hard plastic. Addition of plasticizers makes the material flexible especially for making uh, geomembranes. The PVC, we see them in the form of electrical conduits and so on. We use them for domestic purposes and some of the geomembranes are also made of PVCs. But in this case, we need to add lot of plasticizing materials 
so that it becomes a flexible uh, uh, geomembrane and polyester it contains ester uh, group of um, um, monomer or uh, the chain material and the reaction of alcohols with acids via chemical agent chemical bonding agent uh, to link these um, ester um, uh, groups and the polyamide polymer um, containing monomers joined by peptide bonds and uh, these can occur naturally examples being proteins such as wool and silk and um, some polyamide um, um, products are nylon and kevlar and polystyrene and it is uh, made from the monomer uh, styrene and um, is actually the, um, the most popular polystyrene that is um, in use in uh, geotechnical engineering is um, EPS or expanded polystyrene. It is um, um, it's about 5 percent polystyrene and 95 percent air because basically uh, we inflate it by, by injecting hot air into nodules of uh, polystyrene and it is uh, extremely lightweight filler material. It has a very low density of the order of anywhere from 20 to 25 kilograms per cubic meter. So, it is uh, literally it floats in even in water and especially on soft clays uh, this is a good uh, filler material for uh, construction of engineering uh, structures like embankments or approach roads and so on. Well, the different types of um, repeating units are shown in this table. The polyethylene it consists of HCH repeating unit and the polyethylene is um, used for making um, geotextiles, geomembranes, geogrids, uh, geopipes, geonets and other uh, types of for geocomposites. The polyethylene is the common type of polymer that is uh, used for manufacture of stretch type of uh, geogrids and the polypropylene it consists of HCH, CH3, CH um, units. Um, this is the fundamental um, repeating unit and uh, the polypropylene is once again used for the manufacture of um, uh, geotextiles and then uh, geogrids and um, some types of geomembranes and so on. Then the PVCs it consists of HCH and CL, CH and that is the fundamental unit and that gets repeated and the PVC is uh, used for um, fabrication of um, um, geomembranes and then uh, geopipes that is the PVC pipes and so on then the um, geocomposites. And polyester um, is um, the symbol PET is once again it is a very commonly used pro product for uh, manufacture of geotextiles and uh, geogrids. It consists of a very long um, chain with the formula given here and then polyamide once again it is a very complicated formula so I will not repeat it. The polyamide is um, used for fabrication of geotextiles and um, geogrids and some types of uh, geocomposites and polystyrene also has the chain unit uh, something like this and um, the polystyrene is used for fabrication of um, uh, geofoam and um, expanded EPS uh, blocks and then um, the geocomposites and so on. Well, how do we identify <coughs> a given polymer? The purpose of identification is several fold. One is that the quality assurance and then the lifetime estimation because different polymers they have different lifetimes and um, we also need to understand their uh, degradation mechanism once they are installed in the, in the soil and um, uh, for investigating any failures, the cause for any uh, failure and so on. So, we need to identify the type of polymer uh, for all these uh, purposes. There are um, varieties of um, methods for identifying the type of polymer. Some of them are listed here by looking at the burning characteristics, thermogravimetric analysis, 
differential scanning calorimetry, uh, oxidative induction time, uh, thermomechanical analysis, dynamic mechanical analysis, chromatography and molecular uh, weight basis. Well, the simplest one is uh, the burning characteristics. Each polymer has a unique burning characteristic which gives a rough idea of the type of polymer. So some of the polymers they readily ignite and whereas some others do not ignite and uh, when they get ignited the color of the flame is indicative of the type of polymer um, that is um, that is used. Uh, some of the colors are blue and orange and uh, even the ash that is produced is different for different types of um, polymers. So, by looking at the color of the flame or uh, by looking at the ash that is produced by the burning process, we can identify uh, the different type of polymers and it requires some type of experience uh, because it is all subjective. Thermogravimetric analysis here the mass of the polymer is plotted against the temperature and temperature is gradually increased and the corresponding mass is determined and at some specific temperature the mass decreases suddenly and this happens at different temperatures for different type of polymers. For example, the PVCs at the transition temperature is 300 degree centigrade whereas polypropylene it is 400 degree centigrade and the heating is done in a nitrogen atmosphere in a very highly controlled manner and uh, depending on the temperature at which uh, the mass changes we can identify the polymers and once again it is a subjective uh, type of analysis. The another, another method for identifying the polymers is uh, the differential scanning calorimetry. The, we use a temperature balance and um, we maintain a temperature the temperature balance between a reference cell and a test specimen cell and we measure the heat flow into or out of the specimen and we plot it as a function of the temperature and the sudden changes in the heat exchange occur at different temperatures for different types of polymers especially when they are at some high temperature that defines the at the transition point and there is a sudden exchange of heat and uh, by looking at the temperature at which the heat exchange is uh, very significant we can identify the type of polymer. Oxidative induction time we use a differential scanning calorimeter uh, for this test. We take 5 milligram sample and we rapidly heat it from room temperature to about 20, 200 degree centigrade at a rate of 20 degree centigrade per minute within a nitrogen atmosphere and the oxygen is then introduced and heat flow in or out is observed and the test is stopped when we observe a peak and the time is related um, to the quantity and type of antioxidants used in polymer formulation. And, uh, based on this oxidative induction time uh, we can identify the polymer. Thermomechanical analysis in this test the dimensional changes in the polymer under controlled um, temperature increase uh, is measured and the coefficient of thermal expansion is obtained and correlated to the fundamental property of uh, polymers because this coefficient of thermal expansion is are different for a different type of polymers and by measuring this uh, coefficient uh, in this TMA we can identify the, the polymer. Another method for identifying the polymers is the dynamic mechanical analysis. The polymers are deformed under controlled temperature either in stress controlled or strain control manner and uh, the, we can do the creep or relaxation type of test and viscoelastic properties are obtained and the results from these tests are um, useful in, in uh, predicting the long term performance and the lifetime predictions and depending on the and the properties uh, that we measure in this test we can identify the, uh, the type of polymer because uh, the different type of polymers they have different 
viscoelastic properties. Infrared uh, spectroscopy, we use a Fourier transform integrate infrared uh, spe spectroscopy and subject the polymer to radiation with frequency within the infrared region and if the frequency of this radiation matches the natural motion of the polymer, energy is absorbed and uh, we plot a graph between the wavelength and the transmission and um, identify the type of polymer because um, once there is a matching in the frequency of the, of the radiation and uh, the motion of the polymer, um, we can um, detect the or we can interpret the type of polymer. Chromatography, we can either use a GC or um, HPLC type of chromatography. The polymer is liquefied in a solvent carrier and the components are carried through a stationary column and migration of gases in GC test indicates the differences in the polymers. In uh, liquid chromatography, liquid is analyzed because different type of polymers, they emit different type of gases and um, even the liquid that is produced by this melting process um, is different for different type of polymers and by analyzing either the gas or the liquid, we can identify the type of polymer uh, that we have. Another method is the molecular weight method. Melt flow index is used to estimate the molecular weight by indirect method and the polymer is heated until it melts and the molten polymer is pushed through an orifice under constant load and the weight of polymer extruded in 10 minutes is the melt flow index. A lower MFI means that higher is the molecular weight and obviously as the, um, the molecular weight is higher, it is difficult to pass it through the orifice because it takes a longer time and we are measuring the, um, the, uh, the weight of the polymer in a fixed time of 10 minutes and um, we repeat this test at different constant loads to calculate the flow rate uh, ratio. The slope of the, the melt flow index at different load levels uh, is called as the flow rate ratio and uh, it is different for uh, different type of polymers because uh, basically uh, the molecular weight is different for different type of polymers and uh, so either by looking at the flow rate ratio or the melt flow index, we can identify the, uh, the polymer uh, that we have. The long term strength is, um, is one of the fundamental properties that we are interested in, especially uh, where uh, we have um, uh, significant uh, uh, lateral strains uh, that could happen in the case of steep retaining walls or steep embankments and other things because they are subjected to constant loads and then uh, the structure is free to deform laterally and um, the long term um, properties that we measure in, um, in the laboratory, they can be used for um, estimating the long term deformations. The polymer type is actually dictates the, the, uh, the type of response that a given geogrid or a geotextile undergoes under sustained loading. Sustained loading is a constant loading and that um, the response under a constant load is called as the creep response. So, at the end of design life, the reinforcement strains should be within, a work, within the working levels that could be either about uh, 2 percent or 3 percent or 5 percent or um, some um, finite strain that is um, uh, decided based on the type of application that we have and uh, the corresponding load that we can apply to keep the strains within acceptable limits or within working levels under um, after uh, the service life um, is called as the creep limited strength of the reinforcement because um, there are different types of strengths that we measure. The one is the index strength that is we subject uh, the geosynthetic that is the geotextile or a geogrid 
our, um, um, our geofabric, our uh, geomembrane to quick test, quick loading and we call that strength as the index strength. But then when we subject the same um, specimen uh, to a constant load that remains constant for a very long uh, duration, the uh, geotextile or the geogrid may continuously elongate and um, um, that is uh, that we call as the, the relaxation or, um, or the continuous uh, straining process and uh, the, the strain that we have at the end of the service life. The service life could be about 100 years or 120 years or it could be as short as 10 years or even 1 year depending on the, on the life of the structure that we have. And um, at the end of the service life, the strains should be within, within um, some limits. And the, the uh, typical uh, creep reduction factors that we apply so that we have adequate factor of safety uh, for different materials. The polyester anywhere from 2.5 to 1.6 percent depending on the, and the manufacturing process. It has the least creep reduction factor that is to get the uh, long term allowable load, we divide the short term strength that we get from the, uh, from the index test by a factor of 2.5 to 1.6 to get the creep limited um, strength of a poly polyester and HDPE high density polyethylene anywhere from 5 to 2.6 and polypropylene 5 to 4, it has the highest creep reduction factors. That is uh, if the short term strength says about um, 100 kilo Newtons per meter, the polypropylene will have the long term strength of only about 20 to 25 kilo Newtons per meter. Whereas polyester we could have as much as about uh, 40 to about uh, 60 kilo Newtons per meter strength. Well, the previous part of the lecture has looked at the different type of polymers that we use for manufacture of uh, geosynthetics. The different types of uh, polymers that we have seen are polyethylene, polypropylene, polyester and so on. These three are the, the major um, um, uh, polymers that we use for the manufacture of uh, geosynthetics. And let us now look at the uh, manufacture of uh, geosynthetics. Well, as I mentioned earlier or as we have seen earlier, uh, the different uh, polymers that are used for the manufacture of geosynthetics, uh, they are all of uh, thermoplastic variety, polyethylene, polypropylene, polyester, polyvinyl chloride, nylon, polystyrene. And the first two types, they are extensively used for manufacture of geogrids, especially in the early days, most of the geogrids are of extruded and stretched type. They were um, made of polyethylene and polypropylene and later the uh, polyester has come into being and it is extensively used for fabric, for manufacture of geotextiles and the geomembranes. And the PVCs, they are um, used for uh, manufacture of uh, the geopipes or uh, geomembranes. Well, briefly let us look at the some of the textile terminologies. There are two quantities that are uh, frequently used for um, indicating um, the, uh, the material, the quantity of material that is used. One is uh, the denier. The denier is the weight in grams of 9000 meters of yarn. Yarn is uh, the fundamental um, fiber or, um, or just, like, um, uh, just like a piece of um, um, rope or something that is used for fabrication of um, textile and um, the weight of uh, weight in grams of 9000 meters is called as the denier and uh, another textile term that we use is the tex that is the weight in grams of 1000 meters of yarn and these two are um, frequently used terms and most of the, uh, the manufacturing uh, manufacturers data uh, they include the denier and the text. Well, the fibers are um, 
um, the fundamental units that are used for uh, manufacture of textiles and geo grids and so on. And these fibers they are made of polymers by drawing and stretching the melted polymer. Uh, the, in the polymer that we get is in the form of granules uh, that comes from the refining uh, process of the, uh, the crude oil and uh, once we get it we melt it, we melt uh, these polymer granules and uh, we pass this uh, melted uh, polymer through a very narrow opening of a spinneret which is similar to a shower head just like uh, how the water comes uh, through the shower uh, these uh, the melted um, polymer is made to pass through the spinneret and um, then um, the, the fibers they come out in the form of thin filaments and um, these are cooled and hardened and, um, and then they are stretched, they are stretched uh, to make them strong and um, compared to the raw polymer and because of the stretching process basically all these uh, uh, the fundamental um, um, polymeric um, polymers uh, the, um, they get oriented and um, in the process of stretching we increase the strength and we also increase the strength uh, the stiffness and the stretching reduces the fiber diameter and orients the molecules to gain higher strength and stiffness. Well, the different types of yarns. Yarn is um, basically um, the long fiber that is used for uh, for manufacture of uh, textiles. Monofilament. It consists of a single uh, fiber or single yarn, and multifilament. Uh, it is formed by twisting together multiple monofilament yarns, and uh, the other form of this um, the fibers is a staple fiber. It's uh, we take a continuous filament and we crimp it and cut it to short lengths of 25 to 100 millimeters long and um, we call them as staples because they are short fibers and these uh, staple yarns um, are the staple fibers they are uh, twisted and spun into very long yarns for uh, manufacture of fabrics these are called as staple yarns and another form of the fiber or uh, the yarn that we use is the slit film or we also call it as a split film with this looks more like a ribbon or a tape. These are made from continuous sheet of polymer by cutting into, into fibers of, um, of um, required width and these are called a slit film or monofilament fibers and um, we can also manufacture slit film multi, multifilament uh, yarns. These are made by twisting together of uh, several monofilament fibers of the earlier type and this uh, picture um, illustrates the different type of uh, uh, fibers that we have. The simplest one is the monofilament that consists of a single fiber or a single yarn and um, we can take several of these uh, monofilaments and, um, and then twist them and turn them around to to fab to to manufacture multifilament uh, yarns and these staple fibers these are um, the short length fibers that are cut from a long um, from a long rope like um, material and uh, these uh, staple fibers they are um, they can be uh, wound and uh, made into a rope like uh, structure this is called as a uh, as a staple yarn and then the slit film monofilament which has a considerable width which looks more like a ribbon and the slit film a slit film multifilament uh, we can um, combine several of these uh, slit film monofilament uh, fibers to to manufacture slit film multifilament uh, fiber and these uh, fibers they can be used for for manufacture of uh, different types of uh, textiles. The yarns that are um, uh, discussed previously they are made into textiles using two different methods. One is the weaving process and the other is, is, um, is a, some type of bonding process and the uh, geotextile that is made by weaving process is called as a woven geotextile 
and uh, most of the high strength geotextiles they are of woven type because uh, they give the necessary strength and the different types of um, weaving patterns at the woven, uh, woven geotextiles are the plain weave. Um, this is the common weave um, as we find in textiles. The textiles that we wear like um, in the form of shirts or pants and other things these are all these all have a plain weave pattern. It is also called as one up and the one down uh, type of um, weave like we take continuous yarns and we weave them together to fabricate the textile and um, the other form is the basket weave. Um, we take the two or more warm warp and are filling yarns um, to, f to formulate or uh, to fabricate uh, this fabric um, and then the twill weave is actually we introduce a diagonal, um, diagonal yarn to, uh, to get different shapes and usually uh, this has a um, higher thickness slightly um, um, at the cause at, um, at wherever there is a junction or wherever there is an intersection the, um, the, uh, the, um, the fabric is a slightly higher so that there is a twill pattern and um, these woven um, geotextiles because they are um, uh, we can control the number of yarns um, in a unit volume or in a unit width we can control the strength we can design the uh, the woven geotextiles to achieve a desired strength and um, there are uh, other types of uh, geotextiles which are non, which are known as non woven uh, geotextiles here these fibers are bonded together and um, this bonding um, basically it happens in uh, three different uh, uh, methods the melt or heat bonding the fibers are spread on a roller and joined by melting at crossover points and we produce um, uh, relatively stiff uh, geotextiles by this process. Basically we take fibers which are polymeric fibers and when we heat them uh, they melt and then uh, we establish the bonding by melting and then we do a calendaring process to achieve a smooth finish. The calendaring process is uh, very simple we pass the, uh, the, the geotextile that is produced in the previous step uh, through um, hot rollers. Um, uh, the heat could be different for different type of polymers so that we get a smooth finish and, um, and that bonding is achieved because of the, because of the heating process. And the other uh, process of binding the fibers is the resin, um, resin binding. The, a resin binding is we spray um, some acrylic resin to, uh, to bind the fibers. The, uh, the thickness of the bonded and the heat bonded, uh, um, the resin bonded and heat bonded the fabrics is relatively low and the stiffness could be high depending on the, the type of resin that is used for bonding and uh, depending on the heat that we use for um, in the heat bonded um, textiles. The other um, type of bonding the, the fibers is the needle punched um, um, needle punching process. Here we take a bunch of fibers and then we knit them together like basically we use a number of uh, needles that are closely packed and then uh, we entangle uh, the fibers together to form the continuous mass and um, the needle punching process. Is, um, is used for uh, fabricating a, um, a non woven geotextiles of large thickness and also having a large mass. And uh, some examples of this needle punched uh, geotextiles are our carpets because uh, they are very thick and uh, they also have a heavy mass. Actually this uh, photograph indicates the, uh, the uh, process of uh, producing uh, needle punched uh, geotextiles. We take uh, the fibers, the fiber matrix and then we pass it through a needle punching machine. Basically um, here you see number of needles uh, together and uh, they just uh, simply um, they punch through this, uh, um, this fiber matrix and um, join them together and here 
on the right hand side you see this um, you see uh, you see this machine with the number of uh, these needles and there are uh, these needles are typically 50 to 70 millimeters long and uh, and they uh, bind these uh, fibers together and finally uh, they are um, they pass through some heating element and then they are rolled together and uh, in between uh, we also do some stretching process because uh, basically the stretching process it uh, gives some strength and the most of these um, needle punch the geotextiles they have very low strength but then they have um, very high mass and uh, high thickness and here we see uh, the different types of geotextiles uh, being manufactured so here it's a white color uh, geotextile here it's a, it's a black color geotextile basically the black color is because of the um, because of the addition of um, the carbon black and um, all these um, uh, products they are rolled and packed um, for shipping purposes so that there is a very minimal damage and uh, the packing should be so that they are not exposed to light or um, heat or sun rays because uh, most of these uh, products they are sensitive to, uh, to ultraviolet degradation. So this packing um, should be carefully done and usually they are stored in, in uh, dark rooms so that they are not exposed to light. And here we see some uh, scanning electron microscopes of different types of textiles. Here we have a uh, the top, top left hand side we have the non-woven um, heat bonded um, geotextile and here we have a um, needle punched um, non-woven uh, textile and here we have a woven uh, slit film um, geotextile and woven multi-filament uh, textile and usually uh, the woven geotextiles they have apertures aperture openings of a uniform size whereas uh, non woven geotextiles they have very large number of different types of apertures because the openings the process of manufacture itself is um, is different because of this um, uh, because of this uh, needle punching process and because of the stretching process that is involved the we have large number of openings and we also have uh, these openings of variety of sizes and um, so when it comes to um, to um, to drainage and filtration applications there could be a difference in the way we apply a non woven product and a woven product because the woven product because it has uh, typically of smaller size apertures aperture openings and single size um, openings they get clogged very fast um, soon enough whereas uh, the non woven uh, geotextiles because they have multiple size of um, apertures and a very large number of aperture openings um, they take much longer time to clog. So when it comes to, uh, to the filtration and the drainage applications the non woven um, geotextiles they are preferred um, whereas um, the, the woven geotextiles they are better preferred for separation applications and where the strength is an important um, factor. And this slide uh, shows the, the procedure for uh, manufacture of uh, geomembrane. Basically we take a sheet of polymeric material either HDPE material or a PVC material and uh, we take it through a series of um, hot rolling drums which are um, rotating um, against each other and um, we stretch this, uh, this raw sheet of um, polymer and it goes through several stages um, and uh, we get a finished product and um, finally uh, this um, the finished product is cooled and then it is wound to, uh, to different um, sizes. Typically all these um, geotextiles and geomembranes they come in widths of anywhere from 3 to 5 meters and of lengths uh, up to 100 meters long. And here uh, we see a picture of the manufacture of prefabricated vertical drain. Basically these, um, uh, these PVDs 
are the prefabricated vertical drains. They consist of a core that allows for the drainage of water and then they, they consist of a, of a cover that is the filter cloth to, um, to allow the water to flow into this, um, this drain and keep out all the fine soil particles. And here we see um, this uh, plastic core made of, uh, uh, the core is made of corrugated plastic sheet and it is uh, passed through this machine. It's actually it is uh, uh, these plastic sheets, they are passed through these machines to, uh, to form the corrugations and then it is covered within a, within a geotextile cover and uh, to fabricate these PVDs. And once again uh, these PVDs, uh, they come in lengths as much as 100 meters. And another class of geosynthetics that are, ex that are extensively employed are the geogrids. And the geogrids, they are manufactured by extrusion, weaving or welding process. And the extruded products, these are um, um, made of um, polyethylene or polypropylene. And usually um, these extruded products, they are, um, uh, they have an oriented um, uh, molecules. Then the woven geogrids, they are made of polyester um, um, uh, fabric, uh, polyester um, uh, fibers, and coated with PVCs or latex or bitumen uh, to uh, to stabilize them against um, um, UV light or to protect the um, the fibers against installation damage. And we also have welded type geogrids. Um, which attach the strips of fibers at junctions. The extruded and uh, stretched geogrids, they are manufactured by, um, by stretching a polymeric sheet that is about 4 to 6 millimeters thick and then we punch holes at regular pattern and then we, um, this sheet is drawn uniaxially or biaxially under control temperature and the strain rate so that it does not rupture in the process of stretching. And um, the, um, the draw or the stretch ratio um, is uh, different for different types of geo uh, geogrids. Basically, uh, the more we stretch, the more uh, stiffness that we give to the product and the higher strength is also imparted because uh, we are um, orienting the molecules in certain preferred directions. <coughs> And um, for um, achieving uh, geogrids of different strength, we can um, um, we can vary the uh, the stretch ratio. And um, the higher molecular orientation um, uh, results in higher strength and stiffness, and also better creep resistance. That is, the long term um, strength is higher if there is a good uh, molecular orientation. And the process of uh, um, stretching is illustrated here. On the left hand side, we see the uniaxial uh, stretching. We take a, a polymeric sheet and we punch holes and then we stretch it through this machine that um, stretches while heating and uh, passing through um, a different uh, type of rollers. And um, if we stretch the, uh, uh, this um, sheet in two directions, we have a biaxial uh, geogrid that has um, uh, strength, in the significant strength in uh, two different directions. And in this inset, we see a, a uniaxial um, um, geogrid that is uh, manufactured by this uh, process. And here uh, we see um, some photographs of the manufacture of a knitted um, type of geogrid. Basically, uh, we have um, the fibers that are knitted together in two different directions, the longitudinal and um, the transverse directions, the warp and weft directions. And um, then here we see this knitting process. And then finally, once um, the, uh, the geogrid is knitted, it is coated with some coating materials, basically to protect it against ultraviolet light and uh, to protect it um, against in installation damage during the construction. And um, here on this bottom left, 
you see the uh, the the entire geo grid being uh, covered with some PVC cover and the final product is um, shown on the bottom right hand side and uh, some examples of um, the <coughs> welded uh, polyester geo grid is um, shown here. We take strips of this polyester uh, strips and actually these uh, polyester strips they are extruded so that um, they have good uh, strength, stiffness and long term stability and they are um, welded together at these junctions to, to, uh, to fabricate um, this type of geo grid. And um, um, the geo cells they are also manufactured by, um, by using uh, uh, plastic sheets <coughs> usually HDPE sheets and some companies make out of uh, polyester compounds. We take sheets of um, uh, 1 to 1.2 millimeters thick and they are um, laid um, along the length and they are ultrasonically welded over the full height of the full height of the of the mm, the sheet at distances of 300 to 400 millimeters so that when um, uh, this um, uh, when this uh, cells are opened up we have a honeycomb type uh, structure so basically uh, the um, the number of strips that we take controls the the um, the number of um, the the width that we get for the geo cells and the length of the strips that controls the length of the uh, the length of the geo cells that we get. So basically um, here we have seen uh, the different types of polymers that are that are used for manufacture of um, geo synthetics and a brief about the different types of uh, manufacturing processes that we use for uh, for manufacture of geo uh, geo textiles and geo grids and we have also seen how to produce uh, uh, geo membranes and um, and geo cells okay thank you very much